The United Nations counterterrorism chief, Vladimir Voronkov, is raising an alarm that leading terrorist groups are spreading across the African continent. His comments are in line with President Muhammadu Buhari's piece in the Financial Times of London, stating that with the United States pull out from Afghanistan and the subsequent fall of Kabul to the Taliban, Africa has automatically become the new front line of terror and global militancy. Here to speak on lessons learned for Africa and a forward-thinking perspective on the Afghanistan crisis that will guarantee stability and political survival in Afghanistan is counterterrorism and organized crime specialist, David Otto. Hello, David. Hello, thank you for having me. Good morning, good to have you with us. Good morning, morning. good morning to your audience. All right. Good morning, Lyle. Thank you. All right, David, I mean, tell us, I mean, Kabul fell and the Taliban are back in power. Uh, what are the lessons that we should learn? I know that America uh, is basically self-blaming uh, and the world is, you know, still uh, analyzing what has happened. Uh, uh, is this a coup or is this a failure of what America has done for 20 years? And what are the lessons that you think that we should learn? particularly in Africa. Yes, uh, thank you. I mean, it's, it's been an interesting two weeks um, and, you know, things are still unfolding uh, in, in Taliban's now new, um, you know, government, I want to call it, although that's not it official uh, in Afghanistan. Now, we've got to go back to context here and understand why all this happened. You know, going back to 2001, uh, after the September 11 a massacre, you know, I call it, um, which was blamed uh, squarely on, on Al-Qaeda. And at the time, uh, the Taliban was in charge of Afghanistan as a government from 1996 up until that 2001 when they were removed. So we've got to understand that the Taliban was a government, full government, you know, had all the, um, you know, whatever you can call it, institutions that a government would have, uh, all the international connections. So this was a full government. And it was removed uh, because, you know, the United States uh, did accuse it of, of shielding, of shielding Al-Qaeda, um, you know, and George uh, Walker Bush made it very clear that we wouldn't distinguish between uh, the enemy and anyone who supports it. So the, the reason why the Taliban was taken out of Afghanistan um, uh, power was because, you know, they were accused by the U.S. and the U.S. coalition of shielding Al-Qaeda. Now, th that was the plan, you know, in terms of why the U.S. went into Afghanistan. It was to remove uh, the Taliban government that was there uh, and also to destroy al-Qaeda. Um, of course, you know, um, th that did happen. Uh, al-Qaeda was, you know, uh, decentralized. Uh, but, of course, one has to be very clear that, you know, the U.S. did not succeed uh, to actually destroy al-Qaeda as they thought. Uh, you know, testament to some of the uh, existence of Al-Qaeda today in, 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 um, in Afghanistan, but also some of the Al-Qaeda routes that have spread across the world, specifically so in Nigeria, uh, which, you know, during that same period in 2001, if you remember, there was a movement that called itself the Nigerian Taliban. And that movement eventually metamorphosed into what we have today as Boko Haram, whether it be the, uh, the, uh, the, the faction that used to be run by uh, then just leader Abu Bakr Shikawa, or now the faction of the Islamic, uh, so-called Islamic State of West Africa province. So we already had that. Now, did the U.S. really succeed in doing what it wanted to do? I, I think yes. I mean, they, they, they destroyed um, the, uh, the government that was set up by the Taliban at that time, and, you know, they made sure that Al-Qaeda's capacity uh, to carry out attacks against the U.S. was, um, uh, you know, significantly diminished. Now, does it mean that Al-Qaeda can no longer carry out an attack against the U.S.? You know, um, we don't know that. Um, one has to be very careful how we estimate uh, the um, capacity for Al-Qaeda to launch an attack against the U.S. government. So I think where the U.S. went wrong, and, you know, um, if that is not their policy uh, to destabilize Afghanistan, is, is the reconstruction, is the regime change policy, you know, that the U.S. instituted, um, talking about uh, liberating women, uh, building a new government, 
democratically elected government. This is something that nobody has ever succeeded to do. And the U.S. were warned uh, then by their arch rival when the U.K. went, uh, you know, sent a secret delegation in 2001 uh, to speak to the, the Russian government. They told them that, listen, you go there, you fight, you stay there, and eventually you will run away because, you know, you won't defeat these guys. So the lessons were not learned. The whole change of government is something that was not sustainable. The United States knew this. And when the Taliban took over, just, you know, uh, within 12 days of the, the, U, the U.S. leaving Afghanistan, um, you know, partially, you know, because some troops are still there, one was a bit, um, the Taliban just walked back into power. Um, now, a lot of people are saying that there shouldn't have been, there should have been a resistance, but I think it was a good thing for Afghanistans who have lost a lot of lives that the Afghan government did not resist the Taliban. Because if you are going to lose then you should lose with the minimal amount of bloodshed. So the, the lessons that have to be learned is, is this whole idea of regime change, uh, this idea that you can change a government, you can disband a military and a police, and then simply just install another one. I find um, in, in most of the, the cases that we've seen, if you cite Libya, if you cite Syria, um, and you know countries like Yemen, um, it's simply culture its strategy for breakfast. No matter how powerful um, a state is, you know you can't just walk into a country and, and say you're going to change their government, their culture, their religion, and then install another one. So there's a lot of lessons um, that needs to be learned here. Uh, but people shouldn't compare the Taliban takeover with other terrorist groups in the world. Because remember, again, as I mentioned earlier on, the Taliban was a government. It wasn't a terrorist organization. It was a government that was backing a terrorist organization. So any other terrorist group in the world, Boko Haram, um, you know, ISIS in Mozambique or, or Al-Shabaab that thinks, oh, we can replicate what the Taliban are doing in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, will fail woefully uh, mm -hmm. because this is a different setting. It's a different dynamics altogether. So I hope lessons will be learned. Understood. David, I... We have to take a very short break. <laughs> and when we come back, we will continue on this discussion, which I'm hoping will be a very fruitful and interesting one. So please do stay with us. We'll be right back. We're still joined by counterterrorism and organized crime specialist David Otto. David, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for staying with us. I know we, before thank we went on that break there, you made it clear that the Taliban were a recognized government uh, before the foreign intervention of the United States and the United Kingdom over in 2001. So if, as you said, if any other uh, terrorist organization wants to replicate what the Taliban have, has been able to do in Afghanistan, uh, they're likely to be in for uh, a, a difficult time. That being said, while we can acknowledge and accept that the Taliban were uh, a legitimate government. For the past 20 years, they have been synonymous with terror and with terrorism. And that's because, as you put it, because of its proximity to Al-Qaeda. Now they've regained control in Afghanistan. How, if at all, are they able to create or enjoy any type of political legitimacy around the world with them still having such a strong legacy, as such a strong tie to terrorism? Will they ever be able to be able to, to be seen as a government alone? Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I, I want to make it clear that I don't speak for the Taliban, um, <laughs> but I observe um, the, the, um, the, the political uh, situation and, and how the Taliban behaves. So I'm, I'm making an analysis based on my observations here. Um, you know, the, the Taliban is not the same Taliban um, that was there pre-9-11, that's in 2001, when they were removed from power. Um, in the days of uh, the infamous uh, Mullah Mullah, or Mullah Omar, as they used to call him. Um, what I think should happen, uh, but, but this is you know, just my own predictions, which I've made very clear, is that you know, the, the leadership, you know, people like um, uh, Zabilullah Mujadid, who is now the Taliban spokesman, but, but also Mullah Haibatullah, who is um, the, the Taliban, uh, you know, they're referring him as the, the caliph now um, in, in some quarters. 
Um, he's the overall guy. But nobody has actually set an eye on him, actually. So it's almost like an invincible figure. Now, what I would advise them to do is to be able to look at various reforms um, that will keep some stability. You know, if they claim that they want uh, to have a, a regime in Afghanistan, you know, run by Sharia, um, one that is an Islamic uh, regime, uh, that's up to the Afghanistans. But, you know, to become a country, it's not the same as being an insurgency. So there, there are certain reforms that they've got to look at, uh, particularly so, what took them to this situation. And, and, and the first primary um, focus should be on how they can cut ties uh, with Al-Qaeda. Now, that's going to be very challenging for the Taliban, uh, because for the past 20 years, the Taliban has been fighting side by side. Um, with uh, Al-Qaeda against, you know, what they then saw as the common enemy, perhaps still now do. Um, they saw the U.S. coalition um, as the common enemy. So they've got to cut ties with, it, with, it, with, with Al-Qaeda. But how are they going to do that uh, when, you know, they've, they've been engaging with Al-Qaeda for the past 20 years and Al-Qaeda has actually uh, taken, uh, you know, been a part to their success, you know, today. Um, without cutting ties with Al-Qaeda, uh, this is one of the things which they've promised in some of the agreements that they had in Qatar, in, in Doha, when, when there was a peace negotiation. Uh, they, they said they would cut ties with Al-Qaeda. But without doing that, um, there is the risk, which the Taliban really fears, that the U.S. might come back one day uh, to, to Afghanistan, you know, using its bombing and invasion strategy. The Taliban cannot survive that. So they have to find a way to cut ties with Al-Qaeda. That has to be very clear. The, the second uh, thing which the Taliban needs to do is to ensure that it, it engages itself uh, openly in fighting against uh, extremism, and fighting against terrorism, especially with you know, groups like uh, Islamic State you know, in the Khorasan province, which is one of the biggest mm -hmm. uh, ISIS factions uh, now in, in Afghanistan. They've got to be able to defeat that organization. Of course, they've always been a rival uh, to ISIS, uh, the Taliban, I mean. And that means it may, it, may, it may be much more easier for them to fight against ISIS than against Al-Qaeda. They've also got to defeat the Haqqani network. You know, but again, the Haqqani network is very close to the Taliban. So if they can form a coalition, even if it's you know, something that they do openly and, you know, and, and then maybe aid them behind, then I think the world would be a lot more uh, happy to deal with the Taliban. Now, the third point is that the Taliban has to reform in terms of how it views its women and girls. The Taliban has said that we would allow some reform according to Sharia law. Um, now, what that means is left to be seen. It may simply mean we wouldn't do anything more than we did in 2001. So that's up to the Taliban to do that. I think the fourth point here, which is very crucial, is that the Taliban has to be able to meet its obligations and some of its promises that it made, that it will share power um, with the opposition. People like um, Abdullah Abdullah um, are, are clamoring for that. Um, but also, one of the reasons why the Taliban has been slow in declaring a state after they took over power is because there is a very powerful resistance force that has been established in the valley of Pangji, which is, you know, um, uh, one of the very provinces uh, that the only province, actually, that the Taliban has not been able to take over. There's a very powerful resistance movement there, uh, run by the, uh, the vice president, um, Amrullah Saleh, who claims, you know, rightly so, that in the absence of flight of the president, um, Ashraf Ghani, he is the person to take charge. So there's a very powerful movement there, which the Taliban is worried about, that it may be you know, things may swap around. So you might have them as an insurgency now um, coming after the Taliban. So the Taliban has to look for ways to engage with this resistance movement. And the only way they can do that is to establish some kind of a power sharing mechanism, which is what uh, the previous government under um, Ashraf Ghani was, was fighting for. The last point, you know, um, which you know, has to be made very clear uh, and which everybody is concerned about. You've seen people fleeing um, Afghanistan, uh, uh, people going to the airport, falling off planes, you know, just to escape. Why? It's because people are worried about revenge tactics. Uh, people are concerned that the Taliban is going to come after them, um, and the Taliban is already coming after people. 
Um, we've seen videos of executions of uh, state authorities. The Taliban has to promise that it won't do that. Now, they've said that in theory, um, but in practice, things are happening differently. And this is what happens when you're not an established state yet and you're still running as an insurgency. Those five key points that I've mentioned will determine how successful, uh, it, should the Taliban government be established, how successful it would be. Uh, all right, David. I, I mean, I was going to ask you um, uh, how this compares to the situation in Egypt when the uh, Islamic Brotherhood, you know, uh, took over power and then uh, less than a year into government, you know, it came down, you know, crashing. But your explanation has really given an insight as to if there is some degree of power sharing, you know, and things like that, uh, maybe we might, you know, witness a different Taliban and a different Afghanistan. But more importantly, uh, can you quickly tell us how the Nigerian government should uh, take a cue, learn a lesson uh, from what has happened in Afghanistan? Because the general opinion uh, is that the reason why the government that left couldn't fight was because most of the um, army people that were, you know, most of the people that were absorbed into the army are Taliban's at heart. And now in Nigeria, we have a situation where a so-called uh, Boko Haram repentance are coming, you know, uh, into real life, possibly maybe into the Nigerian army. Is there something that we should be worried about here, you know, taking a cue from what has happened in Afghanistan? I think the first thing which one has to be very clear is that this situation is not going to replicate itself in Nigeria. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, you won't see the Nigerian army abandoning its, uh, its positions um, in favor of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of an Islamic state of West African province, Boko Haram or anything like that. Um, the, the dynamics in Nigeria are very different, um, uh, even in terms of geopolitical, uh, in terms of geo, uh, um, uh, regional uh, dynamics. You've got six geopolitical regions in Nigeria uh, and they don't all have the same um, you know, ways of seeing things. In the Taliban, 98 point or even 99.7, um, you know, has the same culture and religion. Uh, and, you know, uh, so that plays an important role. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, uh, we've got to really remember that uh, the Taliban was a government before. So Boko Haram was it. It's never been. And it doesn't have that same capacity. Um, the Islamic State of West Africa province, you know, does not have this, the same capacity. Now, what lessons can the Nigerian government learn from this? Um, I think one of it is that of inclusive, inclusiveness. Um, and also, more importantly, making sure that they can ad address some of the underlying issues that are plaguing the country's um, insecurity, um, whether you're talking about the North uh, East with Boko Haram or the North West with uh, uh, bandits in Zamfara, uh, in Kaduna, in, uh, in, in Kebi, and, and all, all the Sokoto areas in the, in the North West and, and North Central. Coming back towards the southern part of the country, um, with all the uh, clamoring for secession, you know, by various uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic groups. Um, so what I see here is for Nigeria to understand that it plays a very significant role uh, in terms of uh, the historical connections between uh, the, the, the Taliban in, in Afghanistan and what we have as Boko Haram today. Um, again, I mentioned earlier on that we had the Nigerian Taliban which, you know, then metamorphosed in, into, into Boko Haram. So the government has to be able to look at that and think, okay, how do we leverage, you know, our security architecture to ensure that we don't have members of Boko Haram who have surrendered uh, to infiltrate the system and, you know, tomorrow they can become spies within uh, the security architecture. Now, whether that will lead to the bringing down of the Nigerian government, uh, you know, by some elements uh, within the, the military. Um, it's a very difficult one to measure and even to anticipate. Um, but the general lesson for Africa is to understand that, you know, one might is not actually the right way to go about things. You know, no matter how powerful an army is, you know, the U.S. spent trillions of dollars training 300,000 plus Afghanistan troops. And what happened at the end? Uh, weapons, uh, you know, uh, ammunitions that were given to them, 
they all just walked past and banned on some of these weapons. Some of these guys, you know, um, left the country very quickly. Now, the good side of that, um, I have to say, which nobody talks about, is, you know, if you know that your enemy is going to defeat you, then I don't think there's any point fighting and destroying the country. Afghanistan has been destroyed for the past 20 years. Well, not the past 20 years, actually, uh, maybe for the past 10 years, because there's been reconstruction after that. Um, and what Afghanistan wants is some level of stability. Uh, they don't want any um, destruction. I don't know if you remember, the Taliban made it very clear that we will not fight in, in Kabul because we want to avoid any life loss and destruction. So lessons are to be learned, uh, but I don't think African countries uh, should be worried about you know, Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab uh, taking over uh, you know, the, the, the government at one stage. What they can do, what they have the capacity to do, is to make sure that you know, governance becomes very challenging. Um, but without complacency, you know, they should also make sure that somehow, by some stroke of miracle, um, you know, what happens in Afghanistan doesn't repeat itself in a much more smaller scale. Understood. David Otto, thank you very much for your time and thoughts on this segment for the show today. David Otto, counterterrorism and organized crime specialist, thank you once again.